Hi, this is a recording of lecture two on the history of the idea of evolution. And what I want to do here is give you a very simple overview of the concept of the idea of evolution and how it is built from one idea to the other and there's a kind of an integration um, and so you could see how an idea grows. The um, first point I want to make um, is that we need, we're going to need to do an overview of some of the historical figures that are very relevant to Darwin's notion of evolution. And remember, let's go to the punchline here, what this is all leading up to, the, the basics of the theory of natural selection. And that is, is that all species display variation and in their struggle for existence, organisms with variations that help them survive will reproduce successfully. Third point, nature selects the most advantageous variations and species evolve. And fourth, natural selection changes the view of mankind or humankind as part of the animal world. So that's the basics of natural selection. Okay, in, in part, it's descent with modification. So we're going to start with John Ray, who in this slide uh, you can see um, is a foundational person in so much as he comes up with the idea of species and genus. Um, he's very much um, involved with uh, plants. He was an amateur botanist. But um, he did a great job um, of estimating, uh, it's, it's estimated that he uh, recorded some 20,000 species of plants and concludes from his own observations um, in his book, The Catalog of Cambridge Plants, back in 1660, that diversity is not random. And that form follows function. So this is a big idea that will come into play later on. So uh, again, this idea of the great chain is really give you an, a notion that there were very different views of how the world was organized. In this case, a early form of classification. Uh, your book talks about this at length. Um, now we're on to um, Carolus Linnaeus. Now Linnaeus in uh, 1775 writes a, uh, I wouldn't even call it a book, consider it a pamphlet or a extended uh, fold out. Um, and he, what he does is that he writes in the system of nature, he standardizes uh, Ray's uh, genus and species term, and he comes up with this notion of binomial nomenclature. Um, so he used genus and species names to refer to living things, and he added order, he added a class and order categories. So this four level uh, system is the foundation of taxonomy. Um, and so th this organizes uh, nature in a hierarchical series. Um, he loved nature so much, uh, ironically, that he changed his name, um, Swedish uh, uh, scientist, uh, to a Latin version after the linden tree in his um, boyhood yard of, the, of his home. So this is where we get Linnaeus uh, after the linden tree. So in 1775, we actually have this grand overview. Um, now, one of the things that uh, you want to remember about him is that he classified human be, uh, human, humans or homo sapiens as animals. He defied the idea that humans are separate from the animal kingdom and he actually put that in his uh, system of nature. And he is attached strongly to the idea of the fixity of species. Um, that is species do not change over time. Um, 
And this is where I'm suggesting he is uh, very much uh, in connection to this idea of fixity of species. Spe species do not change. Now, another player in Darwin's evolution, in terms of his uh, sort of play on words there, his own construction of an idea, is allegedly his grandfather was a poet, and supposedly in a book called uh, or a poem called Zoonomia back in 1794, um, writes a line that um, people believe um, instilled in Darwin, uh, that's Charles as opposed to Erasmus, uh, uh, something very powerful 50 years later. Um, Charles Darwin himself says no, but romantics say it um, was the basic love is his grandfather and a premise that is so powerful and hard to forget that um, it made its way into his mind. But Darwin himself says the grandfather had no influence. But the grandfather of this poem has one line uh, that the romantics get attached to, and that is organic life beneath the shoreless waves was born and nurtured in ocean's pearly caves. So it gives some idea about an evolutionary concept or sort of something being being uh, fermented, if you will, in the in the in the ocean, uh, nursed nur nur and nurtured. Ch Charles says no. Uh, now another player here is um, Lamarck, and you have seen Lamarck many times in your science um, training, uh, notably in high school, he comes up all the time, uh, because he had this theory of use and disuse. Now, on the face of it is obviously wrong. Um, however, the theory of use and disuse really puts us into play, what really puts into play the relationship between the environment and species. The changes in the environment make some change to an animal's activity. So his belief results in this increase or decrease use of certain body parts. But what you wanna take away from him is the idea of the relationship between the environment and changes in the environment and changes in the animal activity. Sounds very simplistic, but it's a powerful idea. And um, this is the use and disuse theory that really is fully irresponsible, but nonetheless, uh, at the time, uh, made sense to him. It is the classic idea of the short neck ancestor keeps stretching for the higher leaves, and then the next answer, the next in the line stretches more for the higher leaves, and eventually um, it results in this long neck uh, of the uh, of the giraffe. Um, doesn't really work that way. All right, now here's a person that no one really thinks of as being involved with Darwin uh, at first glance. Thomas Malthus, who's really um, uh, he's an economist um, and um, someone who really uh, uh, made an impact on Darwin in his book, Population and Resources, you see here this essay on the principle of population um, in 1798. In fact, Darwin took this book with him um, on his uh, uh, voyage um, around the globe. Um, now, let me explain why this is important. This is important because um, the idea of, you can see here on this slide, I have it in red, that there, when a population is limited by resources, there's constant competition. And it was the idea of competition being constant. So competition being crucial to selection. Um, leading Darwin to believe that animal populations are held in check by resource availability. Um, so again, another principle. So let me recap so far what we have. We have uh, species and genus, and then an expansion um, to species, genus, 
and class and order. And then now we have um, Lamarck coming in with the environmental changes in the animal activity. And now we uh, can see um, an idea of population coming from a very different economic uh, demographic um, uh, theory, but nonetheless, competition becoming a crucial element in Darwin's thinking. Another book of great significance that few people think about is Charles Lyell's, Charles Lyell's uh, Deep Time. Now, this is a tremendous influence over Darwin. Another book he brought with him, and he read this over and over again on the Beagle when he was traveling the globe. Now, you would think, what would principles of geology have to do with with uh, evolution? Well, again, the idea of immense geological time, and it shapes the idea of time as a concept. And it's Lyle who comes up with this notion of time depth, and you can see it's highlighted here, necessary to think about the slow process of evolution. You have to remember that during Darwin's day, many people held, well, most people held to the idea that there is no change. What you see is forever, the fixity of species. But what you see in that cow is what a cow has always been and will always be. But this idea now of time as a concept is very important. So the discovery of that natural uh, selection. Um, Darwin um, really uh, starts out in medicine at the behest of his father. Um, <clears throat> he um, was a naturalist from his youngest days. Um, he really didn't want to study medicine and just sort of forced into the idea. He spent most of his time um, at university after he basically flunked out of medicine. Uh, at Edinburgh, uh, which was a leading school in, in, its, uh, in its day, um, came uh, back to England and then now studies again. Um, but this time he spends a lot of time um, in um, the, the grips of um, um, uh, botanists and other people involved with um, uh, plant life. And, it, and, it, and everyone begins to see him as a, a, a naturalist and someone who's really um, connected to this world more so than anyone involved in um, um, medicine. So <clears throat> um, uh, there are many theories about how he gets onto the um, Beagle, this five year voyage. Um, on this uh, ship. Um, there's, a, again, a romantic view that some of his friends set him up. Um, you know, they all have a few drinks and after a night at the pub, um, one of them signs him onto the roster. Uh, but uh, that's not true because you actually had to pay to get on this ship. And this is where his uncle comes in. Um, his father really didn't want to have anything to do with um, um, Charles's ideas about um, natural life um, and insisted that he become self-sufficient in some profession. Um, his uncle um, argues to um, Darwin's father uh, that he would split the difference. I don't know how many um, thousands of pounds it cost uh, to get on this ship but he told the father that uh, he would pony up uh, half the amount. And uh, after some convincing, the father said, okay, uh, I guess uh, Charles will have a life of uh, plants and other things and uh, I'll be supporting him, etc." So his father was very negative about his whole uh, pursuit. However, he does um, eventually a, a, uh, board the beagle, but he goes on, and this slide shows you with the idea of the fixity of species in mind. Here you can see the five-year voyage. Now, his sister uh, was very upset, believing that in some respects, Charles would never return, meaning that 
um, a voyage a, a, in 1830 um, of this length uh, around the capes um, of Africa, around Cape Town, down near the Falkland Islands. Um, uh, in other words, the, the, the very voyage itself was problematic in terms of safety, um, survival. So um, that, that was some resistance there. But you could see uh, it was quite a, quite a commitment. Now, what do, what do we know about this? Well, this five-year journey, really, he collects everything. You could see, I'm here talking about the finches on Galapagos Islands um, off of Venezuela, but uh, Ecuador area. But he, um, he really does not... Um, really get over uh, his fascination with nature and is collecting everything he sees. But everyone gets hung up on his work in the Galapagos Island, a stopover off the coast of Ecuador. And here um, Darwin notes the birds that vary from island to island. And he collected 13 varieties of finches and he noted the shape and size of the beak. Um, and after returning to England, he really um, didn't really understand the significance of the variation um, on, on board. But after returning, he starts to study the material and he gets a little insight. All right. Um, now, one of the things that's happening here is that Darwin um, is having quite a time with his idea of uh, Finch uh, and the insights, um, because he now deduces that Finch is descended from a common ancestor, that a different Finch um, uh, be modified over time, and it's modified in response to the different island habitats. Now, Darwin formulates natural selection. It takes him a long time. He borrows the concept from animal breeders and he cho who choose or select a breeding stock of animals. Um, and he works with the idea that each generation um, more, um, uh, there's more competition potentially. And he couples this idea with um, what's happening with uh, changes in the animal relative to the environment. And in 1859, he finally publishes The Origin of Species. All right. So that is my short story on Darwin. Uh, there are many more slides here for you to look at, but they're, again, um, uh, self-explanatory. Thank you.